Welcome to The Long Road. I'm your host, Chris Roberts. And today we're going to talk about a few things that are going around the state and the nation, um, <clears throat> except for the Bearcat coming up on Thursday in the first deliberated session for the um, Keen School, Keen School Budget this um, Saturday. It's pretty quiet in, in the local area. I can't say much about the state level. The state level is just the way it is and it's up to its um, follies. <clears throat> and <clears throat> for example, some of the things that were in the committee that I'm on, municipality and county government, there was a bill to do away with all dog licenses. They said that would help out the, the city clerk. A negative effect on that one was if people don't have to license their dog and the dog gets raped, bites somebody, no one knows if they had their rabies shot or not. You would have to trust the fact that the people would um, take their dog to, to get their rabies shot. But <clears throat> since they don't take their dog, who's responsible and some of, some of the part of the bill would they put all the requirements on the vet to then um, tell the people that they needed to report that and the vet would have to keep the records. The downside is if, <clears throat> if my dog bites your child and no one knows if my dog, is, my dog hasn't been registered, no one knows if my dog had rabies shots, then your child in all likelihood could have to go through a very painful serious series of rabies shots at an expense, something that should not happen. The other part is for all registered dogs, if we pick up a dog, the police pick up a dog, they look at the tag, they now know who the owner of the dog is and they can bring the dog back to the owner. And as we all know, for a lot of people, pets are part of the family. So people don't want to lose their um, pets. And without a dog license, I would say that um, a lot of pet people would lose their pets. The pet gets picked up, goes to the animal shelter, and they have no idea who belongs to the pet. <clears throat> Another one would be a $75 tax credit for anyone um, who had a 100-square-foot vegetable garden. One of the discussions up there as we was going is, what is a vegetable? Tomato is a vegetable or um, a fruit? Well, it has seeds inside. Is a pumpkin or a cucumber a vegetable or a fruit? And so basically, I think it was about $1,500 to, to run a bill, print it, and all this other kind of stuff. So there's a $1,500 of our taxpayer money. Another bill that <clears throat> we defeated in the committee, and we'll be going to the floor, was that someone could get, if you improve your house, you could get up to a one-time $7,500 tax credit. So... If I have a $400,000 house and I want to put a, a $50,000 new kitchen, I could apply for it up to, like I said, up to $7,500 tax credit. Not, <clears throat> not a rebate, not how to call it rebate, but not a, um, what do you call that thing? Um, not a deduction, but a full credit, $7,500. But if we're just the average people with a $150,000 house, $160,000, thousand hard working and can't afford to put it in you can't get the tax credit but because someone else did it next year on your taxes you would have to pay more to cover the cost of that seventy five hundred dollar credit cost the more people in the community that takes advantage of that the um, the more people the more that the average person is going to have to pay of course the building contractors loved it but Luckily, uh, like I said, the committee voted it down, but we don't know what's going to happen on the floor. Another one, it's, this one is um, in the Keene Sentinel on Thursdays, February the 2nd. The House directs $26 million to Rainy Day Fund. I think when I first got to Concord, the Rainy Day Fund was $70 million. After a few um, shenanigans and messing around, the Rainy Day Fund is now $9 million. So what happened was when they did the numbers for last year and it says the budget had a surplus of $26 million. So the governor wanted to carry it forward, to help pay for this year. And even the state treasurer said that um, 
due to the uncertainty in the state finances over Medicare reimbursements and other issues, and given New Hampshire's history of not maintaining robust reserves, a mere $26 million isn't going to change the state bond rating. So the governor wanted to carry it forward. The, the state treasurer said, you know, carry it forward, pay the bills because there's a bunch of things coming up. And right now we're looking at it. The legislative budget for 2011-2012 has a built-in $14 million deficit. So far, we've, we're down $13 million due to the 10% 10 per, per pack um, ta cigarette tax. And what was really great about that, talking to some people, I'm being facetious, that once the state of New Hampshire cut this cotton of cigarettes by a dollar, the tobacco companies down in Virginia and North Carolina, they raised the price of the cotton of cigarettes a dollar. So that $13 million that we used to collect for taxes is going straight to the profit line. And again, talking to <clears throat> a couple of um, stores in Keene, they said the cotton of cigarettes was also raised another 90 cents. So because the cotton of cigarettes was dropped a dollar, tobacco companies could raise it a dollar, and now they raise it 90 cents. And so while they raise it a dollar and 90, it looks like they only raised it 90 cents, except that we as the state basically are getting screwed on the deal with, like I said, with $13 million. Also in um, the budget, there was $13 million that the legislature had counted on in reforming the state retirement system. But it will be half that amount. So right now, that seven, fourteen, twenty-seven, that's $33 million right now that the budget is in the red. And so even if they put the 26, you know, you would be able to save about $10 million in case something went wrong. But again, at the end of the year, come January, Jan June 1st, the budget has to be balanced. So bingo, even if we took the $9 million that's in the rainy day fund and the $26 million that they want to put in the rainy day fund and used every penny of it, we would come out to just about break even, providing nothing goes wrong forward. But the problem that happens right there, and that's not counting the $35 million that's up in the air for the federal lawsuit, against the state of New Hampshire doing some shenanigans again on how we um, count Medicare. Plus, that doesn't count the, um, the lawsuit by the, um, the hospitals against the state by changing the numbers. So again, right there, that could very easily be 100 to $125 million in the red. So if we stay like that in the red or it gets worse <clears throat> and um, some re one report said we're looking at an 18% deficit <clears throat> in just this year. That means they all have to be cut, and these cuts will be coming over the next few months if it happens. And um, Mr. Betancourt, the number three indiv powerful in individual in the state house, says I frequently many of them exotic vacations to take for the men, new big TVs to watch football games for the woman new designer handbags and shoes that would look great. Well, to me, I think that's really kind of insulting because one of the things people are doing now when they get extra money, one of the things Mr. Obama had a problem with is when he cut the 2% on the um, Social Security tax, when President Bush gave people a checks to, uh, um, what do you call those? They gave him a check back. Most of the people either um, use that to pay down bills or they paid extra for, for gas. And so a couple other things is pensions may cost New Hampshire $25 million more going forward. We, um, the state of New Hampshire changed the rules and said people that were legislator even thought you vested, you know what, we're going to charge you even more money. And the court said no. And, <clears throat> but the court did say it declared legal the legislature's most dramatic changes that affect all new highs, including retirement, raising the retirement range and reducing their ability to pay future, to pad future pension amounts, which is good because we just really can't afford it. But the court also said it was legal for the legislature to use old data 
with the express purpose of keeping down the pension rates charged to public employees and taxpayers over the next two years. That's how we got in the game. We were using old data and so because the state didn't want to pay its fair share and so now that the state doesn't pay any, the state goes and says, you know what, we'll use old data so people can get less. But the retirement law, reform law will make a, a small dent in the $4.7 billion unfunded liability. That liability includes more than 3.5 million pension account and more than a billion dollars in medical um, subsidies. And so it requires to pay additional amounts, which may be an amount reserved for other expenses like mortgage without adequate um, additions and benefits. That's why the, co the, um, the court turned it down. And um, so these increases brought in $100 million over the next two years, pivotal to reducing how much pension costs <coughs> go, to go up for um, taxpayers as uh, local. And so basically, <coughs> again, $4.7 billion. That's why you see one of the biggest things that going up for um, the school board and, and local government is the, um, the cost of pensions. This is what we get stuck with for the because of the last 10, 20 years, no one wanted to do the um, the right thing. <clears throat> Another one when we talk about the um, the power, we had a bill that was going to put tax hospitals, basically saying that um, only your main hospital is tax free. So if the hospital built a surgical outplace. Um, outpatient clinic and some of the other things, excuse me, it would say you have to pay taxes on that. What, what it goes down to, it's the city of Manchester. The city of Manchester had an old um, facility, piece of property that they sold to a developer for 25, I think it was $250,000. Um, and what happened is the economy went down, the developer couldn't um, build on anything. So what happened was the developer got with the hospital, Elliot at, <clears throat> at the Elliot Hospital. The developer had planned to own the facilities and lease it to Elliot, which had required Elliot to pay property taxes, which is no problem, but he didn't have any money to finance it. But to obtain financing, Elliot opted for tax-exempt bonds financing, which required it to own the property. So they had to go back and change the plans. And River Edge is now considered on paper to be a 12-unit condominium development with 11 tax-exempt units, although it's not broken up. Uh, <clears throat> the one taxable portion, the day surgery unit, generated 131000 in revenue in 2001. Had the rest of the units been taxed, the Elliott would had the additional had to pay an additional eight hundred and five hundred thousand dollars in taxes to the city, and the city is looking for other property around the um, medical facilities and says, you know what, we can raise one point eight to one point nine um, million dollars in additional taxes. Well, if the hospital hadn't stepped up and, and did this, it would have been like. Um, medic not stepping up to do the railroad property, we would have a big open gap and Manchester would have a, a big open gap. And yes, there are places, you know, in Keene, part of the hospital, <clears throat> they pay taxes. The hospital itself, it doesn't pay taxes, but they pay, they, they pay taxes. And um, one of the questions was asked if, so Manchester is a big city. If I build a, I have a hospital on the west side and I want to build basically the exact hospital on the east side because um, there may be 50,000 people on the east side without medical service. The sponsor of the bill said no, that second hospital would be fully taxable. So if the hospitals in uh, Manchester have to pay taxes, $1.9 million in taxes, they don't create that money. That money is going to have to come out with laying off people getting rid of um, units, like um, some of the hospitals no longer um, provide um, mental health 
because mental health is expensive and the hospitals are not in business <clears throat> to give things away and <clears throat> there's a difference between how, how the doctors are. <clears throat> hospitals are a charitable organization and they try their best to provide as much service a as possible and um, <clears throat> Elliott Hospital provides more than $1.9 million in benefit to the city. And so Keene and, Keen and a lot of these nonprofit hospitals provide more benefits. And um, I think the Cheshire Medical, they had a loss this year. And Elliott, Elliott's profit, quote, if you want to use the word profit, which is not the right thing, but Elliott's margin was 1.2%. And they use that to invest in um, upgrading the facilities. So if Elliot goes and has to pay taxes, <clears throat> they can't invest in the future. Um, and I think what people forget to realize is, yes, if you show up in the hospital, in the emergency room, the hospital has to treat you. But the other question is, <clears throat> clinics do not, in most cases, do not. You can say, yes, they have to. But um, try getting a doctor. A doctor, again, is not in here to, to go broke. The doctor may, for example, if you're a neurosurgeon, you may go 10, 12 years of a lot of training, and you may have 100 to $200,000 in loans. Yeah, you might be living in, in a, a bigger house that people would get jealous of, but you still got to make enough money to, have, to, be, to live on but you also have to pay off your loans. You also have to pay off your uh, malpractice insurance for a neurosurgeon or a hot specialist. Those can be quite expensive. And um, I've seen statistics where some of the hot surgeons and some of the neurosurgeons can make three, four $400,000 a year. But again, that is gross. That is not their, their take home pay. They have to cover their expenses. They have to pay off their loans. They have to continue um, <coughs> education to say current. So they have to pay their taxes. And so all of a sudden, yes, you may make um, $400,000, but yeah, you may bring home a hundred to $150,000, which again may seem like a lot, but when you look at the time and the money spent in investing so you can be qualified by, for that, bingo, that's not uh, much. Um, you go some places, in, for example, in Florida, there are no OBG, oh, I say OBGYNs because it costs so much to get malpractice insurance because sometimes women who have not had no prenatal care will show up at the hospital to deliver the baby. If they show, delivered the baby and something goes wrong, the hospital in turn, the doctor can be, be sued. And so a lot of doctors won't take that risk. A lot of hospitals won't take that risk. And so Keen, like I said, Cheshire Medical does a, a great job. They help out and I think, I think what they heard that they provide about $4 million in, in services and reducing um, some people's bill based on their ability to pay, giving free service to other people that, that can't pay. And so again, <clears throat> that tax money is going to have to come out of <clears throat> salaries. It's going to have to come out of public good service. The question is, for example, <clears throat> does, um, being hypothetical, okay, if we, the hospitals and, and the facilities, every all the facilities had to be had to pay taxes, except the hospital, would the hospital then in turn provide services to the community as a public service in events like the pumpkin fest? And if they don't have money, I would say, I don't see why they would want to, or they may want to, but how could they afford to? And that's, um, that's gonna be a big question um, going forward. Another big one that came up that even the mayor of Manchester came into is that um, refugees and New Hampshire gets about 250 refugees a year. <clears throat> and, and refugees are unlike 
<coughs> immigrants, while they are in fact immigrants, but the refugees come from basically all around the world, and they, they may be come from Bosnia, um, <coughs> they could come from Afghanistan, there's a few from Iraq, there's a number from um, <coughs> Africa, and these refugees have suffered, in most cases, they have suffered a pretty traumatic um, <coughs> experience. They may have been raped, their family members may have been killed, they're in, in a border place, they may be a Muslim who's living in a Christian place who's persecuted, or it may be Christians living in a Muslim country that, that's, that's persecuted. It may be a homosexual or a lesbian who could be easily, um, in certain countries, put to death. So there's, there's a whole bunch of, of reasons. And um, basically, <clears throat> I would not want to be a refugee. You would not want to um, be a refugee because you have to, like I said, you have to suffer a lot of pain, the great majority of it, and it basically you have to be traumatized. And in most cases, you, your life was really on the line. And so, again, I think um, the last one was the United States had an opening up to 70,000 refugees, and the last one they, they took in like 48,000. Just because they're, um, <clears throat> we can take more, it doesn't. We don't. For example, if I was from North Korea and I was a Christian and I was being persecuted and I was able to um, <clears throat> get out of North Korea and because of the risk to myself and my family, I may be gra um, granted refugee status. And yes, while the United States takes the majority of the refugees around the world, just because I'm a refugee doesn't mean I'm automatically going to the United States. The mayor of Manchester came in and said, you know what, we don't want any more refugees. We want a, at least a one-year moratorium. And, um, well, but here's, <clears throat> here's a question is, um, how can a state put a moratorium on um, <clears throat> what something with the federal government does? Um, I asked the mayor and I asked a number of other people a number of questions and it was kind of like, well, how many refugees are in Manchester or in New Hampshire? How many, um, <clears throat> where did they live? How long did they quote unquote stay in the refugee? Are they working? And um, what is the cost to um, the public welfare and the public tax base? Um, one said he thought three to 4,000 refugees were in. Um, the mayor said the refugees were having a very serious um, impact on um, New Hampshire's ability to meet no child left behind objectives. And so what I did when I went on <coughs> online and, <coughs> and I was gone, I said, there's got to be some answers better than um, what they were giving me. And then there was a report, Refugees Resettlement in New Hampshire, Pathways to Barriers to Build and to Building Community. And it was published in 2009, and it was by the University of New Hampshire. And so, <clears throat> and even thought it went up to fiscal year 2008, so that made it 08 to 09. And it basically said that, um, Manchester, Laconia, and Concord are three of the cities that, um, that get refugees. And um, <clears throat> in 07, New Manchester got 99. Yes, in um, <clears throat> 08, it was 246 in Manchester, 59 in Laconia, and 192 in Concord. And so basically, the state of New Hampshire got 500 refugees in 2008. Now we're here in 2011 and 2012, and the max number of refugees that New Hampshire could be given is 250. So it's a basically a drop off of 
And so from 2008 to fiscal year 2009, Manchester got 1,504 refugees. And so easy to see that wasn't the three to 4,000 that Manchester thought they had. Laconia got 188 and Concord got 590. But what would seem to be quite different from Laconia and Concord, Laconia and Concord both had um, well one programs and um, they don't seem to have a problem. One individual came in who owns apartment complex and he says um, he has no problem with, with refugees. They're hard working and um, they're really good tenants. And he goes, in a lot of cases, they're better tenants than some of the other people. And um, <clears throat> who, it goes, individuals and local governments who have become involved in refugee resettlements, even as they shoulder the responsibility and take refugee families in their lives, <clears throat> often question federal refugees pr that plays struggling, sometimes tra traumatized individuals and family in New Hampshire. They ask, why here and why these people? and sometimes conclude no more should be sent. Some refugees also wonder why they've been placed in New Hampshire. And as the University of New Hampshire says, the point of fact, New Hampshire needs a young and working population, and refugee makes a small but vital contribution to fill this need. For those with concern with the aging of population, slow growth in to total population, and decline of the young population in New England and the state, Refugees are um, good news. But one of the things it said, in this time period, 4,851 refugees were, put in, were initially sent to New Hampshire. And basically what it says, almost 50% or about 2,400 of the refugees that were sent to New Hampshire moved out of <coughs> New Hampshire after, after six months to a couple of years. And, um, and basically, they, they may go to New York or, or Boston or whatever to get into one of the communities that f makes them feel much, much better, at, much better, much more comfortable like being at home. So if you're a Haitian refugee, you might want to go to New York and live with the Haitian um, community. People have said over and over again, the refugee is such a drain on the city services, they're taking welfare, they're, they're doing this, doing that. I don't want to pay my um, taxes to, for refugees. <clears throat> and what happened is the critics of the report, such as the City Welfare Commission, pointed out in the year of the report, 2005-2006, refugees representing only 2% of the Manchester families receiving any city welfare. The city spent 12474 in a whole year, that's all they spent, 12474 on refugee welfare support out of a budget of $498,000. And, and I just found it really <clears throat> amazing how they were, um, people were coming up and saying things, why we can't have refugees, why we shouldn't have refugees. <coughs> Of the 250, that, again, so in 2008 and 2009, it was 250. The number sent to New Hampshire is disproportionately small in terms of um, refugees <coughs> admitted to the United States. Be between 1997 and 2008, during that period, the largest cluster, almost 50%, were refugees from the former Yugoslavia and the former um, Soviet Union. The second large cluster, 1,800, came from 17 different African um, countries. And so basically refugees <clears throat> made up a 0.04% of the total New Hampshire um, <clears throat> population. So in a number of places you may not even see um, refugees, especially the um, 2,237 that came from Yugoslavia and the former Soviet Union. And yes, some places in Concord, it's easy to pick out some refugees. And, but there's the question is, you know what? If I'm black and I'm from sub, 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 Sub-Sahara, Africa, 
I stick out. If I'm from Yugoslavia or Eastern Europe, where I may have blonde hair, blue eyes, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to stick out. And <clears throat> not to be racial or whatever, and I'm not going to go and say we should get refugees from one place or another. Nope, they should all come by the same standard. But that's part of reality. And so if I'm from Eastern Europe and I look like everybody else, as long as I don't open my mouth and you hear my accent or whatever, I can pass just as a, a regular um, person and people would have no question whatsoever. And part of the report said in 2007, <clears throat> the Department of Health, a family of four would need $20,650 to be living above the poverty line. A family with four with two children, two parents working would need 48,000. A two family parent with one working would meet, need 36,000. And a single family with two children would need 41,000. And so that I found that pretty enlightening because <clears throat> there's a lot of families in Keene would be hard pressed to get that amount of um, income. And, and again, when they go in and talked about going back to what it's saying is the refugee children had such a negative effect on um, Manchester's um, kneecap scores, the, um, the city average in elementary school in grade three and grade four, <clears throat> only 59% of the uh, Manchester students were proficient. Grade five, it was 56. That's in mathematics. In um, reading, 65, 61, 55. And in writing, 38. And middle school, <clears throat> yeah, so we go back in mathematics, the city average was 59, the state average was 80 for grade three. Grade three reading, the city average was 61, the state average was 80. Grade five um, writing, it's 42, um, well, it's 38, and the state average was 55. <clears throat> um, we go to sixth grade mathematics, city average 59, state 71, reading 61, 77, writing 42, 64. And the <clears throat> Manchester um, deputy superintendent says, I'm not prepared to specify why. There are many variables taken into consideration when you look at low assessment rates compared to high assessment rates. And these numbers, the amount of refugee children in um, New Hampshire, in Manchester, is way too low to distort these numbers. And so, again, we're in this situation when um, basically New Hampshire is a state that's really made up of a lot of immigrants, and now we want to go and say, hey, we don't want the refugees because they're having a negative effect on our education and our taxes. And the reports seem to, to point elsewhere. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to get ready to um, take a, a quick break, and um, we'll come back with some more clipboard information. Okay, I yeah, hope you enjoyed the clip.
Welcome back. Um, <clears throat> I got to do a few more clips. We're using some old clips as some people would probably have. But being tied up in um, <clears throat> Concord four days a, a week for the past three weeks, and this week too is um, <clears throat> kind of not leaving me very much time. And so, like today, I went to Concord and I came back at about five, ten minutes before the show would stop. So, today we're going to go in and we're going to talk. Um, about inside the numbers. <clears throat> There's an article right here from the <clears throat> Los Angeles Times, America needs more well-paying jobs. The predicament we face isn't simply that there are too few jobs, it's also increasing number of workers who don't have the kind of job that can pay the bills. While productivity has grown by more than 80% over the last 30 years, wages have effectively been flat for 80% of the Americans. <clears throat> We always hear about productivity, productivity, and what does productivity have to do with um, jobs? Well, let's look at it this way. There's 100%, okay? We're going to start at 100%, and I'm going to have productivity for 3.5% each year for the next 10 years. So what does that mean to the average person? <clears throat> 10 years ago, if I go in, in 2002, and I can, so if I made this 2002 and this is 2012, what, what productivity means, <clears throat> I can make the same amount of money, the same profit on 30 less people. And in most cases, I'll make even more, more money. So basically, these 70 people right now in 2012, with the help of computers, other type of technology equipment, are doing the same work that uh, of a hundred people 10 years ago and people go what so every time productivity increases not every time but the majority of time that productivity increases that means I have to um, I get to use less people so if I use if I can get 97 people to have the same output as these hundred what I would do is yes my profit <coughs> would go up but what you would expect is, hopefully, as I have people working, less people, but working harder and harder and harder, that they would basically get the opportunity to share part of the increased profits. And like the <clears throat> article says, in 30 years, 30, so 30 years ago, 1982, if I go back to 1982 and I had 100 people working for me in 1982, basically right now today, 2012, I would have 20 people. 20 people, like I said, with new equipment, new computers, new technology, would be doing the same work as 100 people did 30 years ago. And basically when people talk about <clears throat> the upper 5% making more money, well, the reason is, if I can get 20 people to do the work of, of 100 people and I don't pay them any more money, all that extra capital that's made from it goes into my pocket. And, or it goes into my, this company's stock. And that's what we talked about last week. So if it goes into company stock or it goes into investment and I'm making money from my money's making money, there's again, I only have to pay 15% capital gains on the majority of my money. And <clears throat> what we're talking about, since 2008, we have, we lost 8.7 million jobs as a result of the recession. Okay, <clears throat> since then, we've gained back, <clears throat> you got to give Mr. Bomber credit because he's the guy in, in office and the guy in office takes credit for any upticks. The guy in office also takes credit for any downticks. So what's happened was <clears throat> 8.7 and over the past two years we've had 2.5 million jobs created. And um, that's not counting um, this month. So that means 6.2 million people. There's 6.2 million less jobs than there was basically three and a half years ago. And so if there's, more, if there's less jobs, more people looking for jobs, there's really no need to pay um, people more. And that's what, what happens. 
And um, <clears throat> so, give you an example how it changes. This talked about the chief executive, chairman and chief executive, Mr. Sargent of Staples. It was one of the companies that um, Mick Romney was able to save from um, bankruptcy. Well, in 2010, the CEO and the chief executive got um, same same positions. He earned $15 million for his position. But jobs in retail, one of the fastest growing sectors in recent decades, tend to pay poorly. And again, when you go in and look at some of the jobs, you have retail jobs, you have legion jobs, you know, travel agents and all that kind of stuff, hotel. Staple jobs don't seem to be an exception to that rule. Sta Staples sales executive or easy tech associates make less than $9 an hour. An employee working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, at that rate would make significantly less than um, the federal po 2010 federal poverty level threshold for a family of four. So <clears throat> there's a catch. Again, when we talk about tech associates, yeah, back here, they get paid more. But as in, uh, productivity increases, there's more people looking for less jobs. So supply and demand requires it that um, their jobs, the salaries go down. And <clears throat> but eight point f at this time, 8.5, but that's a deceptive number. The true employment rate is over 15% if you call <clears throat> but all persons marginally attached to the labor force. If you add those people to the people, to the people who have full-time work or just above the minimum wage, at least 1.5, one in five Americans or 30 million people do not have a decent job, which explains why according to the Census Bureau, 46 million people or about 15% of Americans live in poverty. Again, what people don't understand is you can be working full-time you and your wife, for example, or your partner, could be working full time, have two kids making $10 an hour, and qualify for food stamps, qualify for rent subsidies, because you just can't afford it. And there's a question. It's just not a matter of paying jobs. It's about a matter of creating <coughs> jobs or maintaining jobs. And we go in and talking about jobs, Governor Motors, this was from Va Vermont Valley News, hey, the bailout worked. There was a lot of people that complained about the bailout. President Bush um, gave $17.4 billion out of the top fund and lent it to General Motors and Chrysler. Two months later, President Obama gave $7.5 billion. So basically, that, at that time, about $25 billion. And um, <clears throat> at the time, the government owned 61% of the company, General Motors, and the auto workers agreed to considerable profit sharing. Plants were closed, labor costs were cut by two thirds. But now, General Motors is profitable again. Investors are still skittish. The stock trades about more than 25% of the additional $33 um, dollar price. Taxpayers still own 26% of the shares, down from 61. Um, <clears throat> even, if the even if the government sells at a loss, the cost of auto bailouts is expected to be no more than $14 billion. Chrysler has already paid $5.9 billion back with interest. The Congressional bu Budget Office had predicted without the bailout it would cost $40 billion. Had GE and Chrysler been allowed to fail in the first two years alone, it would have cost the government $28 billion in lost tax revenue and unemployment um, payments. Again, people just look at the small ones and not looking at the big picture. General Motors is setting its sight on making over $10 billion a year. GM is reported to, is set to report net income about $8 billion, its highest ever and nearly twice the prior year's 4.7, the newspaper said. And right now, from the <clears throat> basically, it has a 6% profit margin, and basically over the next 10 years, it would expect to have a 10% profit margin. It would be the highest profit margin in, in auto industry. So in 2000, 2009, losing billions of dollars and facing extinction, General Motors um, <clears throat> took about $50 billion in government subsidies. They're paying it back. And basically, 
over a four-year period, if General Motors and Chrysler had been allowed to fail, it would have cost $56 billion in lost tax revenue and unemployment. So <clears throat> whether you like it or not, I think it worked, and the numbers seem to make it work. Chrysler is, is being profitable. Ford is being profitable. General Motors is being profitable. And so, <clears throat> again, again, whether you like it or not, whether it's big government or government motors or whatever, I think that um, it kept a lot of high-paying or well-paying <clears throat> manufacturing jobs in, in the United States. Um, so Fiat bought a major portion of Chrysler, and the Chrysler workers are still working in the United States. They haven't been transported over to um, Italy or someplace else. Now another trick um, <clears throat> of a bill up in Concord And um, <clears throat> they came with the bill that would say, you know what, let's deduct $50,000 50, <clears throat> off of every um, person's home. And we, you know, that'd be really good. Well, <clears throat> and so what I did was, for example, I used the $30 keen tax rate. So right now, if you own a $50,000 home, you pay $1,500 in taxes. You know, and so far, you want 250, you pay 7,500 dollars in taxes. So a lot of people jumped up and says, "This would be really good. This would be able to help out a lot of people <clears throat> in their taxes." Well, under the normal rate, it's four. We got. I'm making it 45k. <clears throat> it was 450k, 450 thousand in tax revenue, but when you did the 50, 50 thousand. It brought it down to three hundred hundred thousand. So there was a hundred and fifty thousand dollar less in um, <clears throat> tax revenue. So part of it was the political game to to backdoor. So people go, oh yeah, people would say, yep, I'm going to vote for this. This is a really good idea. And two things would have two things possibly could have happened. Then all of a sudden, the people go and go, holy crap. There's $150,000 less in tax revenue for the city and the town, schools. And so now all of a sudden they would be having to face a $150,000 um, cut in their operating budget. Again, people would not have paid attention and they would go, wait a minute, I don't want to have these services cut. But then they would be able to say, hey, you went to the town meeting, you voted it in, so there's nothing I can do because this is what you wanted. Or on the other side, what I do is by the 50, taking the 50,000 off, these people right here would have to pay no taxes. But if the community wants to make up 150K in taxes, that comes out to about $375 extra per house. And you go, wait a minute, you know, for the remaining 80 houses, I'm counting this based on 100 houses. So what's 375? 375 may not seem like a lot, but if, if I have a $100,000 house, my taxes go up $375. So all of a sudden, my tax rate, compared to the old, goes up 12.5%. 150, well, it goes the same, it's 8.3%. 200,000 is 6.2%. 250, it's 5.0%. So as the value of the house goes up, the percentage of the tax increase drops off um, <clears throat> drastically. So if I had a $750,000 house, for all intents and purposes, $375,000 is less than 1%. Again, so it's not going to make a really big deal to me, but it's going to make a big deal to the people that have a $100,000 house, $150,000 house, especially if they're only earning 12 to 15 bucks an hour and, so, and they're pinching their pennies. So again, that's looking inside the numbers and what you have to do when you look at some of these bills is what's the intent of the bill. And what they do up in Concord is they put nice names on the bill so people will jump on it or they're going to say, hey, I'm going to take $50,000 off the value of your house this may work in um, really good communities, like Wyndham, who only has about a $6 tax rate, and some of the other wealthy communities. But 
all of a sudden, if you go to a community like Chesterfield, uh, not Chesterfield, Winchester or Claremont or Berlin, where <clears throat> they don't have they don't have industries that can cover the the loss, because you can go to Berlin and you can get some three family three um, room houses for less than fifty thousand. You can go to Winchester and Claremont and get houses for less than a um, hundred thousand dollars. And so it's not like in Keene where we can go and say we have some expensive houses. We do have like the Monadnock place or we do have places downtown <clears throat> that could make up the, the costs. Some of these small communities would be um, devastated. So they would be saying, wait a minute, you know, my first 50,000 is um, wiped out. And, but all of a sudden, the $35 tax rate may go up to 45 or $50 to make up the, um, the difference. So again, looking through the numbers, and as we're getting ready to close the show, I'll just have one little here from a talking point. Here they are trying to get rid of the dollar bill. And it's a perfect illusion of how difficult it is to reduce any federal um, expense, no matter how modest. On the pro-coin side, you have the steel workers union and metal mining industry groups. On the other, you have the paper and ink manufacturers and groups like the National Armored Car Association, which claim that hauling heavy coins will increase fuel costs. When even this relative, relatively minor issue is subject to intense special in interest lobby, the chances of Congress reading, reaching an agreement on big stuff like Medicare, Social Security, and Defense seem smaller than ever. Just to go and show, it doesn't matter how small something is in Congress, there's lobbyists on both sides fighting to defend it. And so I've been up to Canada. I have no problem with the dollar coin and the $2 coin. It seems to work really well, and it saves Canada money. But in the United States, we're going to fight about it, and we're not going to do anything. So I hope today's show was interesting and um, gave you some extra facts. And again, I say thank you for the people that come up and say a good job. And oh yeah, one little quick one. There was an article in the Keen Sentinel, well, led it to the editor, and um, there was one little error in it when I was talking about the end, and it talked about the speaker saying the comment about the rapist. When I wrote the article, it had a small s because a small s shows it wasn't the, sp the house speaker. Just one of those grammar things, how you can make a little small s and a big s can change the whole article. But that was a mistake in there, and so just letting it out there. And it wasn't the speaker who talked about the rapist. So again, I will see you on the long road and be here next week. Thank you.